and what did your uh, parents do for living? Sure. Um, well, I'm a, an Australian. I'm from Sydney. Um, you know, grew up uh, most of my years in, in Australia. Um, uh, my, my dad was actually was in, in technology. He was he worked for NCR uh, back in the 80s, uh, which uh, builds all the banking infrastructure. I think you see ATM machines now with, with NCR on it. Uh, my mum was a teacher. Um, and in the later years, they, they started a business uh, doing wholesaling, online uh, wholesaling for um, arts, crafts, textiles, things like that. I did a pretty much a technical background. I did computer science, uh, engineering, electrical engineering and physics at, at university, um, undergrad, uh, grad school. Uh, very lucky, actually. Um, I uh, back back in when you when you graduated from school around 1996, you didn't really have the big startup industry that you have today. And so when people thought about technology, the, you know, the pinnacle of your career you thought was to become, a, become an ac academic uh, at a university somewhere. So I applied to overseas universities, and I was going to do a PhD in robotics, MIT, and through a, through some bizarre That's stroke of some stroke of luck, I did not get in. Um, and so, but I did get into Stanford. Uh, and a bunch of other places, and so I thought, gee, my, my career is over. I, I won't be an academic at, at MIT in robotics. I guess I'll go to Stanford. The campus looks nice. Um, uh, so I went there and landed there in 1997, which is probably the best time in the history of mankind oh, to yeah. land at Stanford, um, and did a master's in electrical engineering. And, um, but and so how forth. did you even think of going to Stanford? I didn't. I just applied to everywhere. I thought that the marginal uh -huh. cost of applying to a second university was, was de minimis. That's so true, I, yeah. once I filled in the first application form, I just downloaded as many as I could. Uh -huh. And um, it, 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 luckily, I did that. If any of you wants to apply to, to, to university, to grad school, um, you should just apply everywhere because it's completely random how you get in. Or, or, the process is just so bizarre. I mean, you go to these universities, and everyone is so, so brilliant. If you just try and compete on marks, you won't get in. You've got to kind of show other things. And just through some stroke of luck, I guess, from the, the grad student through the papers in the air, it landed inside the circle rather than outside the circle. And Stanford back then, uh, you say 97, uh, it was the best time for uh, doing something like this uh, in uh, in engineering even. Uh, what have you learned there? Uh, let me. This kind of started me, it didn't really start me on my path of entrepreneurship because I guess at an early age, I realized I was fundamentally unemployable. So I had to kind of create my own job. Otherwise, I'd constantly get fired or get into too much trouble. So I was always doing entrepreneurial things, but I didn't actually think of the word entrepreneur. I just kind of started a business doing this or started a business doing that. But Stanford's where it really kind of all formed it together and, and provide the structure and the thinking. Um, now, 1997, when you were there, you didn't really think that this was, you didn't really think that, that Stanford was the place for, um, yeah, you know, where where you didn't you didn't anticipate what was going to happen in the next three or four years, right? Um, tech was buzzing. I mean, the the, the the university is absolutely phenomenal. You go there, and the big difference, the big culture shock difference, I guess, between uh, like an Australian university, and I presume to a certain extent maybe a British university, is that you know British is all the theory and you build up the background layer upon layer upon layer. But when you look at a case study or doing a project, typically it's on a company that was t 20 years ago or 10 years ago you, or a process or a technology that's 10 years ago and you study that, right? Because that's well well understood. At Stanford, it, the stuff you're studying is actually in the lab and hasn't even gone, gone to production yet. So you know, when I did VLSI chip design, we were doing it in, in a certain um, micron and that micron process was not was not in production yet. That was what Intel was going to do next year. And that was, that was really eye-opening. But I mean, the really big thing actually happened in one of my first classes, and this kind of ties into, I guess, to the, to the, to the entrepreneurship story and ultimately the freelancer story, is um, you can pick your own classes. So you can do cheese making, you can do, um, you can do wine making, you can do all sorts of bizarre classes and kind of stitch them together into a, into a, into a major, right? Um, or you've got to do breadth and you've got to do depth. And, you know, so I took these classes from places that you know, I wouldn't be able to do um, if I was back in Australia. I did space systems engineering, which was designing a, a, a spaceship for going to Mars and a bunch of other things like that. But oh, wow. I did this one class called um, uh, IE273, which is technology venture creation. And this class was about starting a company. So I thought this would be really fun. It's competitive entry. Only had 40 people in the class, 10 teams of four. One person's the CEO, one guy's the CFO, one guy's the CTO, one guy's the head of sales and marketing. And in that class, you write a business plan and everyone's trying to get into that class, and I, I got accepted to it. And and at the at the end, your mark is determined by you pitching to a panel of venture capitalists and entrepreneurs. And back then, I didn't really know who the venture capitalists were, but now I realise they were the best venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, like you know, John Doerr, um, Jeffrey Yang, all you know, all the top guys. Yeah. And um, you know, and that's your mark. So I'm in this class, and it's a funny story. So I'm seeing this class, and um, you know, at the back of the class, and I wasn't really paying attention. You know, like the student, you kind of sit at the back of the class, you know, daydreaming a little bit. 
And uh, the first lecturer was this guy called Ken Hawke. And he came in and said, listen, I did this class three years ago. And so remember, this is 1997. So he did the class in 1994. And he said, everyone in Silicon Valley wants to know what happens in this class because Yahoo started in this class. Excite started in this class. Um, he said, let me tell you a story about what I did. So everyone was coming up to me saying, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And he had no idea. So he said, listen, th this guy came up to me and said, listen, I'll give you $1,000 if you write a business plan in this class for this thing I want to do. And he said, well, what is it? He goes, it's a mail order battery business. And Ken said, well, gee, this is kind of boring. You know, I'm, I'm an engineer doing my MBA. I want to do something that's a little bit more tech focused. I mean, mind you, this is 1994. 1994. Everything needed a spare battery, right? Your laptop, you carried a spare battery. Your phone carried a spare battery before Steve Jobs decided to turn hardware into a subscription model by not allowing you to pull the battery out. So you bought a new phone every year when you didn't need to. Um, but everyone was, had spare batteries. And um, but he said, no, this, this, this idea is pretty boring. Um, and he had two weeks to come up with his idea. And at the end of the second week, he goes, um, look, I can come up with my idea. So what I'll do is I'll take the $1,000, I'll give my teammates $100 each, and I'll kind of just work, work on this metal battery business. So he did it, and gets to the end of the class, and the guy who comes up to him and says, what do you think about the business? And he goes, actually, I, think I love it. And he spent the whole, whole uh, quarter on it. And he goes, well, if I finance you for this business, how much money do you need, and will you do it for real? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, okay, so he went, went off, and long story cut short, it, it became 1-800-batteries.com. He goes, the business is now worth $75 million. I will fund four teams in this class, quarter of a million dollars each. The guy who backed me will fund four teams, quarter of a million dollars each. And the whole class just went, Jesus Christ, what's going on? And because it's the first time you've been in a school class where it's like, you know, eight, eight teams potentially get funded quarter of a million dollars to go do something. So we're like, okay, so we're paying attention. And um, long story cut short, um, but... The teams that came out of that class, over the years, I've seen them, uh, what they, the, the people in that class, what they did. The total market capitalization of companies started by the 40 people in that room in my year alone is somewhere north of $80 billion. Oh, wow. $80 billion. Yeah. Um, there was a guy in my class that came to me and said, uh, Matt, you're doing a security course because my depth was in security. Um, um, you know, can you please look at the software for this thing I'm doing? It's for um, sharing money with your friends um, over the Palm Pilot. You beam out of the infrared port. Um, uh, you know, can you look at the security? And I looked at it and said, there's no security in this whatsoever. I said, aren't you worried about people ripping you off? And he goes, it's for sharing money with your friends. If they're going to rip you off, they probably shouldn't be your friend. Yeah. And I said, this idea is retarded. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, uh, that was called Confinity, which then merged with X.com, became PayPal. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, you know, it was it $70 billion later for that company um, and so on. But, but, you know, it's just, it's amazing. The guys that came out of that class started all sorts of amazing businesses. And, you know, it was an amazing time. Everyone there was just thinking about starting a company. And it just became more and more that, you know, this is what you did. You go to Stanford, yeah. you start a company. Everyone's starting a company. You're lucky. Do you still keep in touch with some of the guys from your class? Yeah, I do actually. There's a few. Um, there's there's about um, uh, four or five of the five of us that actually became really good friends. That that um, yeah, have done all sorts of weird, wonderful things. Okay, and then you stayed after you graduated. You yep. still stayed for a while. Yeah. Um, well, I I I graduated really quickly from Stanford actually because everyone's just rushing to start a company. Um, so I did the masters in the minimum time possible, and then I worked in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I um, worked at a startup. Uh, it's funny, very funny stories about this as well. We probably won't get into the detail, but um, worked in a startup. The startup got bought. Um, it was crazy times back then. We were 22 people. We this had is the bubble, right, right now. Well, the, the, well, the thing is, I have a very strong view about, about bubbles. Mm -hmm. um, in the first tech boom, um, the technology got better and better in every year. The, yep. the the bubble that appeared was in the public markets. And this is potentially what we're seeing, again, happening in the public markets as we speak. Uh, and I gave a really good talk at SIDSTAR just recently about how to not get screwed by venture capital, mm -hmm. which hopefully I'll give in London when I'm here, if I can find a venue for it. Um, but really talks about exactly that, what's yeah. happening with Square and Dropbox and Box and all these late-stage valuations and the unicorns and whether you can, the unicorns are tripping over and, and, and so forth. But um, now it was a very funny time. We were 22 people. We had no, no product, no revenue, no idea what we were doing. Um, and, the company, and I was employee number eight, so I wasn't the founder. Yeah. It got bought for $64 million. We thought it was too low. <laughs> um, okay. You know, and, uh, but it got bought by a big investigations intelligence company called Kroll, uh, mm. which is around the world. But um, yeah, worked, for, worked in the Valley for a while, came back to Australia, worked briefly as a venture capitalist. 
realized that being a venture capitalist is the most soul-destroying job in the world. It um, is. Particularly if it's not your own money. Because all I was doing was disappointing entrepreneurs. Every day, you have 100 business plans come through the door. And every day, all you're doing is meeting entrepreneurs. And every day, all you're doing is saying, well, not many venture capitalists say no, mm -hmm. because they don't want to be on that said no to eBay or whatever yeah. in the early days. But all you're doing is disappointing people by dragging them on, dragging them on, dragging them on. Because the reason why is the practical lim limitation of a fund is you're funding two per year yeah. or five per year, depending on how many partners you have. So you're not funding very many investments. The ones that you do invest don't come through the front door. They're because someone rings up the, the, one of the partners and says, we're doing this, we need a co-investor or whatever. Yeah. And so you're just constantly disappointing entrepreneurs. And I, I just found it soul destroying, just constantly doing that. And then eventually one of my um, a thesis supervisor from years ago came to me with an idea I left and helped him set up a business. And eventually I started my own tech company after that. So you had a few failures before we started to to, to a successful company. Uh, yep. Can you tell us something about those and the lessons you've learned there? I had multiple failures. Um, I think that uh, without those failures, there's absolutely no way I would be in the position I am today with, with Freelancer yeah. on, on multiple levels. It's not just being running a com company successfully, mm -hmm. but also re retaining um, a large percentage of the company in terms of equity, um, structuring it and so forth. And I think that, you know, Anyone can hold the rudder when the sea is calm, but yeah. when the shit hits the fan, that's when you learn how to sail a boat, mm -hmm. right? So what and are the biggest mistakes you've made? Oh, I, I, plenty of mistakes. So um, Sensory Networks, which was my company before, was a textbook uh, example of every single mistake you could make, we made it, yeah. pretty much. We built integrated circuits for high performance pattern matching and network traffic, so fantastic technology. Ran about, ran at, ran at gigabit per second. Um, you can think of like a graphics chip, but for scanning network traffic. And it's basically regular, like a big regular expression pat matching chip is the way you can think about it. So mm -hmm. you can put in there virus databases, spam databases, um, content classifying um, databases, whatever it may be, and scan it at ultra high speeds. The problem was there were no gigabit networks in 2001. Well, if they were, they were in data centers and so forth. So it was way too early for the market. Yeah. I'd rather be late to market every single time rather than early to market if you think about it. That's interesting. Right? I mean, Facebook was last last social network to market mm -hmm. pretty much. They thought that social networking was dead. Bebo had collapsed. Google was the last search engine to market. Yeah. Right? You had AltaVista, Hotbot, Ask Jeeves. You know, when Ron Conway invested in, in Google, they had no business model. He said, well, I've just cashed out my um, Ask Jeeves on the IPO. Mm -hmm. And if these guys are anywhere as good as they say they are, they're going to be much bigger than Ask Jeeves. So I'll invest in Google. Right? Yeah. You know, Microsoft was the last operating system to market. There hasn't been a paid operating system since then. Freelancer was pretty much the last Freelancing marketplace to market. That's true. Right, you know, we had uh, this February Vinod Kosla on stage in at a, at a conference, Silicon Valley, and he was saying that uh, he met these two guys uh, who were doing something around search on the internet, and he was on the board of a company called Excite, and he was trying to uh, link them up with Excite uh, because uh, he hoped they would buy uh, the these two guys' idea and invest in it. Uh, Hundred thousand, they wouldn't, and they said no like three or four times until the point that uh, Excite CEO was telling Vinod, please stop harassing us about this, we, we don't want to invest. And those two guys were Larry and Sergey, uh, the mm -hmm. founders of Google, which, and Vinod felt so bad for those guys that he invested himself. I, they were there at university when I was there, right? I didn't know okay. them, but I knew, I saw them around, oh, cool. right? I used their search engine because I took pity on them. Yeah. Exactly. Like literally, I mean, I used Google, it was hosted at, on the Stanford servers and it was quick, and I actually think in the early days, the fact that it was fast loading, yeah. and they, you see this now with the Google methodology around rail so and fast loading websites. Well, because the problem was that the other search engines like Excite and so forth had banner ads at the top. And so when you had your modem and you dialed up, you had like load, 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 yeah. load, yeah. load of the banner ad, uh -huh. and then you get down to the, the rest of the page, and Google was just basically Simple. an input box. Yeah. So it was quick, and I kind of felt bad for the guys, and so I, I used the <laughs> search engine. What happened a couple, of, a couple of years later, those guys got bigger, and the Excite search engine went bust. So then they hired the team of, of Excite. Yeah. And now the CEO of Excite works for them. Oh, look, so there's, so many, there's so many stories. I mean, oh, yeah. they tried selling to Yahoo for a million dollars. And they were just, please, please buy us, please buy us, please buy us, please buy us. Nobody wanted it. Look at them now. 
Yeah. So, so, so we've learned uh, that you made all those big mistakes, uh, especially around funding. Uh, as we discussed earlier. Yeah. So, so, so we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we were I got a bit distracted. So we were way too early for the market. Mm -hmm. We had the wrong product. We had fantastic technology, fantastic team. Yeah. So about seventy people, eight university medalists, the brilliant people, deep technology. But there are different ways you can sell technology. We chose. We were really scared being engineers of sales. Yeah. Very, very scared. So. I didn't want to hire a sales team and put the chip inside a box and sell an enterprise network security appliance. I, that would, hire, would require hiring a US, high-powered US sales team. We had no experience in sales whatsoever. Um, we, were, we were from Australia, which means I'd have to go to the US and run a sales team. So instead, we chose a, the easy technical, well, the relatively easy sale from an engineering perspective, which is a technical sale, which, supply the, which is to supply the technology OEM to network equipment manufacturers. This is a very, 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 very tough business, and it was completely the wrong way to sell the technology. What we should have done, put it in a pizza box, sell it for 10 grand a box. It would have been like Barracuda on yeah. steroids. Barracuda became a massive billion dollar business. Mm -hmm. They started after us, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, that's what we should have done. But instead, we sold the chips, so because it's a VP engineering to VP engineering discussion. We were more comfortable with that. But the problem with that is, you're selling it to network equipment that has a one-year product cycle. So every year there's a new, pro new box, which means the sales cycle is potentially two years long. So you talk to them and say, you can't get in this year's box, you're going to the next year's box. It's hardware, so you can't upgrade it in the field. It's something that has to come to a new product. So they're going to put you in the high-end product lines uh, for a short period of time. It's a squeeze model in terms of, the, uh, in terms of the, um, the, um, the business model because you're supplying a component into a box. And the rule of thumb roughly is if you put a dollar into a box at the cost of production, the sales price have to go, has to go up 8x, right? So every dollar of cost of production, eight times after you go through the channel to the retail price. So we were, and the thing is, the, 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 our technology, while a differentiator and really, really fast, the vendors are not willing to change the price of their product. Or if they do change the price of their product, the volume goes down dramatically. So you're stuck. And basically what we ended up doing is we were competing against the Intel CPU is fundamentally at the core of that business model. So for every dollar, the, that they put into our product, the dollar had to come out of the Intel CPU. And competing against Intel is not a winning strategy at all. So that was, that was a problem. I took money, frankly, from assholes. Uh, there's some venture capitalists that, one was okay, and then we were forced to do a co-investment with another venture capitalist, which was a disaster. Mm. And from day one, it was just literally butting heads. From day one, they were advertising my position uh, as a CEO. I didn't really want to be a CEO at the time. I was happy being an um, engineering guy or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so forth, but we butted heads repeatedly, and that dragged through the entire um, the entire uh, period of, of being in the company. And let me be very be very very careful um, when you raise money from someone, because the average length of the investment now is longer than the average marriage, and you spend more time with your investors than you do with your, your spouse. And if you get it wrong, it is toxic. That's very true. Now, from what you've learned, yeah. uh, are there any signs you can spot uh, a bad investor? And I really appreciate you walking away from the company or, or, or quitting the company for a uh, integrity reason, which is which is cool, uh, uh, because it shows that you really care about the company and the employees. Uh, how can you spot people like this so we can avoid them? Well, before we even get there, my biggest advice to you is the best place to raise money is from selling something useful to customers. Yeah. Right. Take money as a last resort. Too many people get hung up thinking. A venture capitalist is the solution to all my problems. It is not. Mm -hmm. The solution to all your problems is you. Go out there and just start a business. Find some, some way you can sell something quickly to customers. Iterate on that. Customers will finance you yeah. as well. Um, sometimes if, if, it, if you're doing a big um, product that requires uh, in, lots of engineering, et cetera, ahead of time, sometimes a customer, you can say to them, if I build this by this time, will you give me some money up front to kind of go work on it mm -hmm. or whatever it may be? Um, you know. Um, and go out there and sell something. Um, with, I mean, taking money should be really as a last resort. You dilute your equity, you dilute, dilute your control, and so forth. And if you do do take money, I always prefer to do it under a transparent uh, white regime, which such as, uh, you know, I financed, I pretty much bootstrapped the entire business of freelancer. Yeah. Took a little bit of money at the beginning to buy the first website, mm -hmm. which I'll talk about probably later on, but no money was ever raised um, operationally to run the business. And then the first money we really took in was when we took the company public, which is an interesting story in itself. But you know, when, you're, when you're listed, it's one share, one vote. It's transparent. You know, everyone has the same rights and yeah. privileges. So at the beginning, your, your, your only investor was the customer? 
Well, I had one major investor who gave me the money to buy the first website, but after mm -hmm. that, it was just a customer. Bootstrapping, yes. And uh, s some lessons we have some audience, uh, some audience members who are uh, in the process of raising funding. Uh, what are some, some tips which you would share with them? When I have a that? fantastic presentation, which I just gave. It's in start. Can you do like I'll a three minutes? Find some way to. Okay. Uh, don't raise money from, from venture capitalists. If you do raise money from venture capitalists, make sure they've got operating experience. Uh -huh. they've, they've run companies before because um, they know it goes up and down, etc. Um, make sure you read every single line of the documentation that you sign. Too many people go, oh, wow, I've got a term sheet. I've got to take it. And they just don't read the terms. Let me tell you, the valuation number that you get for your company, it doesn't matter what it, what it is. It could be $100 billion. It could be whatever, right? The, the, if you don't read the terms, the terms will actually manufacture whatever the payoff is that the investors want. Yeah. So they can give you a billion dollar unicorn valuation if you want, that's fine. I'll just take it two or three times you know, participating preferred liquidation preference, which means that you know, if the company sells, I, you know, unless it sells above a, above a, above a threshold, reasons. I take everything, yeah. like 100%. Would you right? prefer to have uh, your own term sheet when you're negotiating a deal? I always did that. VC is a little bit shocked when it happens, yeah. but that's what I did. Always control the paper in any negotiation you have, even if it's a contract. Never get, the, never let the other party draft the co documentation because it's a lot easier for you to put whatever you want in that in that term sheet or whatever you want in that in that, in that agreement, mm -hmm. and let them do the red ink, because it's hard to send. Like psychologically, this is you know the power, of the art of negotiation. Uh, one of the things is psychologically, you're anchoring, you're anchoring the deal with a certain structure. And it's very hard to red ink everything and reset everything without them going, no, no, use our term sheet or use our deal documentation. So I actually did that um, in the last oh, you did? some number of times with venture capital. I actually wrote the term sheet. You can find term sheets, just Google online, you can find the term sheet yeah. and just download them. That's a very good point. Uh, that's a very good point. And so now you work as a venture capitalist, then you build this company, then you walked away. And what happened then? Well, I mean, this is a freelancer story, so this is kind of interesting. So I was, you know, just briefly, I walked away from the company because we, we the company wasn't really succeeding. It, it was doing about two and a half million in revenue, I think, at the time. We had a bunch of venture capitalists. We had conflict at all levels. Just naturally, venture capital leads to conflict because you don't have one share, one vote. It's not all aligned. You have these different rights and privileges. So I had old VCs who had been there for a long period of time that needed, under the mandate of their fund, to get a return quickly, so they had to sell. I had new VCs that wanted to build it up and build a big business. I had um, Australian VCs. I had American VCs who thought Australian VCs were hokey, and they were. Um, I had uh, corporate VCs. I had, it was just so much conflict, just because of the privileges and the rights that each of them had and the, and the objectives they wanted to achieve. And then they were also, we had conflict with the, with the, with the management, right? Yeah. If it, you know, we were the kind of the collateral damage of everything. Um, so I walked away after a disagreement about something, I won't get into the detail, but I was I basically, um, it was very disharmonious uh, how I walked away. I walked away and said, well, if you're going to do that, this is going to be my $30 million MBA. And of course, they didn't like that very much. And so I walked out and I had taken money from I guess, nine venture capitalists, I can't remember the exact number. And um, I was pretty broken. This is like one of those, what they call a dark moment in entrepreneurship where, you know, I think Elon Musk says being an entrepreneur is like you know, crawling through broken glass, with, you know, on your hands and knees. Very it's, true, it, yeah. You know, one minute you're on top of the world, it's great, we signed the customer. Next minute, oh my God, it's fallen over, the website's crashed, whatever, someone quit on me, my founder quit, what the hell, what's he, what's he thinking? You know, next minute, wow, some revenue came in, that's great. Next minute, oh shit, there's a chargeback. You know, next minute, like, like it's just, it's just every day, it's just like it's this, adults, right? Yeah. And uh, until you get, get cash flow positive, once you get cash flow positive, you can breathe a little bit because when you're cash flow negative, every day there's that smell. What's that smell? It's the smell of burning money. And it's like, gee, how much money have I got left? How yeah. much time is it before I've got to raise more money? Uh -huh. How long is it going to, uh, you know, you know, et cetera. And you're constantly stressed. And then you get a little bit of, little bit of um, leeway when you're cash flow positive because you can go, you know what? I can just do nothing today. Just hold. I can make the decision because tomorrow I'll have more money. Yeah. Right? And, and so forth. Um, Sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> yes, uh, so um. th then th th this story is for the audience. Uh, uh, Matt, oh, yeah, I started. Matt gave yeah. his mom the best present I've ever heard of. Oh, uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving, let me tell you. Oh, my God. So what happened was this. So I'd walked out. I'd walked out of the business, and I was just destroyed. I had all my friends in it still. I hired the best people I could find. They're brilliant engineers. I had put my life and my passion into it. For six years, I'd walked out, and I was broken, right? I... Every, you know, all the venture capitalists hated me because I made a bit of an arrogant remark when I walked out and I had conflict all the way through. So that, you know, that I was a pariah in the venture community. Um, all my friends were in, stuck in this company I'd left. 
I just didn't want to do another business again. I, want, I just wanted to find a way to kind of live without having to start a company, right? Just sit at home and just, I don't know what I was going to do. So I took its time off and I did a bit of skiing or whatever. And, you know, it was a very, very stressful part of my time. And I thought, okay, I was working on a few little side projects from home. So one of the side projects was I, I told my parents in 1994 to build a website for their business. 94. It would have been like the first e-commerce site in the world, right? Probably, uh, yeah. And you know, nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. Gets to 2007 and I go, bugger it, I've got some spare time now. I'll build them a website for their business. It's a wholesale business. I didn't realize that there were 10,000 products that were not photographed without descriptions. So I had to take 10,000 photos and 10,000 descriptions had to be typed up and build this website and whatever. And it's the gift that keeps on giving because the, the damn thing is still around and it still has things that need to be fixed and updated, whatever. And I now have, luckily have a team that um, I delegate to you, use freelancers on my site. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and I, have, I have a whole team that deals with Matt's mum <laughs> and all the problems. And luckily, freelance is a solution to my mom's my problems. Yeah. But, um, uh, but basically, yeah, I, was, I, wanted, I built this website and then I needed to, you know, one of the things I did with it was I, I built another thing which was a directory. It was a directory of all the shops that bought from the, from the company. Because yeah. I figured that people that weren't in the directory wanted to be in the directory and then they could just sell to them, um, you know, marketing and so forth. So, but I needed da data entry done. I needed a spreadsheet filled in with, here are all the names of the shops, here's the address, here's the phone number, here's the URL. And I thought, this is really boring work and I don't want to do this. So um, I thought, someone's little brother and sister must love to do this work. I'll give them $2 per, per line, uh, per row, and um, I'll say 1,000 rows, $2,000. And I remember when I was in school, I would have loved to have 2,000 bucks worth of work I can do on my own time sure, yeah. on a computer. No, no, how boring it was. But it was just so frustrating. I f I'd find people, and I'd give it to them, and I'd work on it for half an hour. I'd go, this is really boring. I go, no, it's boring. I'm giving you $2,000 to do it. That's right. I, I'm paying you money to do it because I don't want to do it because it's boring. Or I've got soccer practice. I've got exams. Ugh, it's excuse. And I, I finally, I just got fed up. And I like, went to Google and I typed in cheap data entry. I mean, where do you go for that sort of job? You can't advertise for it in a newspaper. You can't go to a job board. I mean, so, and I just found this website. It was called Get a Freelancer. I mean, just a few minutes ago, I think we typed cheap data entry. And it's still number three, seven, and nine or something on front page of Google. Back then, I was number one, at least as it was for the, the Australian uh, version of Google. But um, and the site, I didn't know what it was. Get a freelancer. It was all looked like Craigslist. It was just, you know, designed with leftover paint from the USS Midway. It was just greys and it was horrible, right? And but it looked like stuff was happening there. So I posted a job and I said, oh, I just need this data entry done. I thought, okay, two thousand dollars, and I walked away and I actually forgot that I posted the project. I went and had lunch. And I, uh -huh. I came back to my email. I go, what the hell's going to my email? It's like 74 emails. I'll do it for 2,000, 1,500, 400, 300, 200, 100. I was like, what? Okay, this can't, this can't be for real. What is this? This is, first of all, I was blown away by the fact that I couldn't find anyone, not, not one person, and now there's 74 people doing it. So I thought, these have to be bots or something. <laughs> there's no way that 74 people want to do the job. And secondly, for $100, I'm willing to pay two grand. There's someone willing to do it for $100. So I just hired this team. Um, they're out of Vietnam. Um, and they did the job in three days. It was perfect. And I didn't have to pay until the job was done. And I thought to myself, Jesus Christ. I just thought, this is just incredible. And I just, the, the whole world just opened up to me. I just thought, this just solves so many of my problems. I didn't want to go start another company. I didn't want to go. I, I want to start a company, but I do want to go hire people and go through all the hassle and raising money and all that sort of stuff. I, here I can just sit at home with a credit card, like in my underpants, and just put the credit card in, the, in and just hire an army of people to do things. It just, it's just, it's just, I just saw enlightenment. And I thought to myself, this is incredible. There's all these things I can do. What, what should I do? And then I, and then I had a thought. And I thought, gee, this website just, I thought it's amazing. I thought, surely this is Surely this is going to be a big space. It's like, a, it's like an eBay for jobs. I thought, you've got global marketplaces for products. You've got Amazon, um, you've got eBay, eBay second-hand goods, Amazon first-hand goods, uh, and now you've got Alibaba. I thought, you've got global marketplaces for products, which are huge. These are multi, you know, tens of billions of dollars market cap companies, if not hundreds of billions. Surely a marketplace for services. Like, like a global, why isn't there a global marketplace for services? I thought... This, I mean, there should be a multi-billion dollar company in this space. Surely this is a space that's been forgotten. I should get into this space. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll use the website to copy the website. So I actually, um, it's a funny story. Uh, it's multiple, there's a meta story here as well. So I 
used Get a Freelancer to copy Get a Freelancer. I was doing the programming. I built my own website called bititout.com. I was hiring freelancers to do the graphic design and all these other bits and pieces and market research. Off the website. Yeah, off the website to copy it. And I started a site called bititout.com and I got it going. I was testing out the business model and I thought, okay, let's look at the little financials. What, and this is what I always do. I go, how do I make a million dollars in revenue? What, what's the price have to be? How many units do I have to sell? Whatever, blah, blah. Yeah. How much money do I have to raise? And ultimately, how much to make a, to make a million in profit? And then, okay, I thought I need to raise maybe $4 million to get this going. I thought, fuck, I've got to go talk to venture capitals again. And I thought, okay. And I, looked, I did a bit of a survey of the space competitively and there were hundreds of guys doing this. Uh, and girls, but they were very small. And there's about 12 that kind of had some traction, 12 um, France businesses. They hadn't really set the world on fire yet. And I thought to myself, no one's going to fund me to be number 13. Maybe I've got to move quicker. And the other thing is that first million dollars in revenue is the hardest million dollars in revenue sure. you'll ever make in your life. It is just so tough. Yeah. Especially if your idea is new and you have to change consumer behavior to, to go and do that. Mm -hmm. So, let's so, 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 for a while because uh, the biggest lesson here is. Uh, if you want to build a successful business, do something for your mom, which uh, pays <laughs> off. That's how we found it, right? Because yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. of that. And then uh, we also have this question on Slido here. Uh, how did you find your first customers, both developers and users? Yeah, so I cheated. So I bought. So what happened was at this point I said, no one's going to fund me to be number 13. So I've got to buy rather than build, and maybe someone will sell me a business. So I contacted all the guys in the space and I said, do you want to sell? All the ones without any institutional backing yeah. uh, or any VCs in there. And about four or five said, yeah, we're interested. Ironically, um, the first site I used, Get a said, we're interested as well in selling. Um, we've got some people in due diligence already. Mm -hmm. They said they had four PD people. They actually had six companies in due diligence. Uh, um, I said, just send me the information. They sent it to me. I, and, I, and what impressed me about Get a Freelancer was it had more traffic than anyone else because the guy who, who put it together killed it with SEO. He really knew SEO really, really, really well and dominated the space. So the way I found it, typing in cheap data entry, it was number one in Google, was the way everyone else was finding it through SEO. Yeah. Right? And so I started talking to him and negotiating with him and I said, listen, um, how, much do you want to, how much do you want to sell it for? And the price was less than the amount of money I was going to go raise to start from scratch. And I thought, well, gee, this is a no-brainer. And I said, listen, um, and I thought, gee, how am I going to get the money because everyone hates me in the venture community. So I said, listen, I'll get an option agreement in place. I'll give you the price you want in 45 days. If I don't give you the money in 40, 45 days, I'll help you sell it to someone with twice the price. Mm -hmm. And so a that's, a win, that's a win-win situation for him. Yeah. Um, I went out there and, and it took a bit longer than 45 days and he extended the contract and this and the other. But I eventually I found uh, Simon Clausen, who um, he's my major investor from the beginning. He put, put some money to buy the website. He sold his business to Symantec. He built PC Tools, which was um, Spyway Doctor, for those of you that remember. Yeah. He cashed out a whole bunch of money from that. I didn't actually think about how much money he had. I actually went to him and said, do you want to go on the board? Because I'm a team of one. Mm -hmm. Being a founding team of one is impossible, unless you've kind of done it before. Yeah. And even then, it's impossible. And I said, I need to build some credibility around the company. I said, would well, you want to go on the board? Went to a few meetings with some. And how some, did you meet him? Well, we were trying to put his software on my chip. Mm -hmm. So he had anti-spyware oh, okay. software. We were trying to put it on the chip to, to demo it. Um, and that never really happened. Well, it didn't really go anywhere. So I just knew him. I said, do you want to go on the board? You've had experience in consumer internet. He said, yeah, sure. And I took him to a few meetings and the investors were more interested in him being an LP in their fund than they were in, what is this website? Bangladesh, what? You know, Swedish. Uh -huh. It was you know, run by a guy living on a fish farm in Vanuatu. It's like, what is this? It looks like, looks like Craigslist. It looks terrible. And uh, I'd like to buy Craigslist, by the way. Uh -huh. uh, huge opportunity there. Um, so you got the money from him? So I made from him. And you bought the website? I bought the website. That's how we cheated. And then you started to buy all other smaller players, mostly those who are not funded? Well, there's two, there's two things that we grew the business. One is, and I, you know, looking back at it, the, the, the way I kind of bootstrapped the business has led to the whole philosophy around how I run Flancer today, which is really it's driven by data science and growth. Yeah. And data science and growth is really the modern way of doing marketing and product product strategy where statistically every change you try and make, you, you, you narrow it down so it's atomic, you then statistically test is there a positive or negative change, and then if it's good we keep doing that, if it's bad we regress. So you always and, test? Well, back then I was doing it in a, in a, in a really rough sort of way, mm -hmm. but um, but that's the philosophy is just, just conti process of continual improvement every day, just try and make a change, make a change, make a change. And now we've got that down to a complete science and art form and the, t the team I think is probably one of the best in the world for growth. Um, the, all the talks from Sid Start, we've got all um, Willix Halim who's my growth guy, phenomenal guy. Uh, I listened to his talk, I'll blow you away. Um, but um, 
So just make changes. So I looked, I looked at the business and it just had all these problems with the business model. The, the, first of all, the site looked like crap. So I called up my friend who's a designer in New York, graphic designer. I said, listen, can you just come up with a template and I'll just I'll do the coding, I'll reskin the site. And at the time, this, co this company had half a million users, it had uh, one customer service agent in the Philippines mm -hmm. uh, who worked the graveyard shift, had three people in the Ukraine doing customer support and programming. Um, the Ukrainians were like, no, don't change it to color. It hurts my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was like, so I reskinned it. And let me tell you that the minute yeah. I reskinned that website to make it look a little bit more Western uh, consumer focused, revenue doubled instantly and permanently. Oh, wow. And of course, cash came in from there. Uh -huh. Had some other problems with the business model. You know, it's 10% commission um, for the freelancers, or if you paid $12 a month for a gold membership, it was zero. So 76% of the business going through it was at 0% commission. So that's stupid. So I changed but it to. How, how did it evolve over time, uh, the business model? Still pretty much the same, um, but we've just, um, you know, we still 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 10% for freelancers, 3% for employers, mm -hmm. but we have, you know, other things. All these, the very the philosophy with freelancers is it should be free to use, and when you when you start making money, we take we take a clip, yeah. and if you want to pay for other things, they're optional. You can, and there's always you know, upgrades, and there's a lot of money in upgrades, um, but and uh, you know, really, it's you know, it's designed so someone in Bangladesh can sit down on a computer log in, bid on a job, talk to people, etc. And if they win a job and start getting paid, mm -hmm. then they pay 10%. Uh, okay. So now we have this website, which uh, and you're trying to make the first million. And uh, was it already freelancer.com or it was It was getafreelancer.com. Okay, and how did you change it to freelancer.com? Well, this is, a, this is one, of the, one of the pivotal moments, early, I guess, early on in the, in the business. Um, yeah. So I had a get a freelancer and, you know, Simon um, Clausen said, oh, you should buy the domain name freelancer.com because when... Uh, he sold his business. He bought a whole bunch of virtual real estate. He bought software.com and a bunch of other really premium high-end domain names. Yeah. And he said, you should go and buy freelance.com. And I go, oh, okay, it's kind of expensive. You know, we're a startup. You know, we're doing a million in revenue. So I bought a business that's doing one million in revenue. Right? So I had some money and I was hiring staff with that money. And everything I do today, every marginal dollar I make, I just hire another smart person. Yeah. That's you know, headcount rent and that's it. There's no capex in this business. So... Um, so I said, oh, I don't really, you know, why do I need a different domain name? I, you know, Shakespeare said, a rose is by any other name still a rose, right? I thought, when I go to someone on the street and I go, you know, who do you work for? And I work for Get a Freelancer. Oh, I get it. It's Get a Freelancer, right? I get it. Wow. But if I, I work for Freelancer, and it's a bit abstract. There was a computer game by Microsoft called Freelancer. What does that mean? You know, and still today, if I have a badge and I go to a conference and it says Matt Barry Freelancer, he goes, oh, you're a journalist. I'm like, what do you, you know, who, do you, who do you write for? And it's like, That's <laughs> funny. Um, but he said you should buy it because what happens if someone else buys it? And I thought to myself, That's gee, point, yes. we'll be subordinated forever. We will be get a freelancer. They will be a freelancer. I do not like to be subordinated, so I will try and buy this. So it was owned by a guy, a British guy, living in Canada, um, who used to have a, a, a paper magazine called Computer Freelancer. Uh -huh. And I think the magazine went out of print years, years, years before, but he still had the domain name. He was using it or it was just, hmm? was he using the, the website? No, I wasn't using it. I said, how much do you want for the domain? And I think he said $750,000. I'm like, <gasps> it's like, oh, gee, I'm not going to pay that. I said, I'll give you 20 grand. He goes, go away, you're an idiot. 20 grand. And then, then I went back. And it was kind of funny. It lasted for about a year, the negotiation. I uh -huh. said, how about 22 grand? He goes, you're an idiot. Don't email me. Uh, a few days later, you know, I had a beer at the pub on it. I emailed a guy, I had 24 grand. He goes, you're an idiot, go away. And I was, literally, this went on for like months. I have the email chain, it's like 26 grand. <laughs> it's like, stop <laughs> calling, <laughs> stop messaging me. Like, uh -huh. you're an idiot, right? And then it just went on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And, and eventually, one day, he goes, listen, you're a funny guy, give me a call, right? You've been like emailing me for the last you know, nine months or something, right? Like, yeah. I spoke to him, I had just a chat and this, that, the other, and blah, blah, blah. Did you know what company you're from? Uh, no, you didn't? Okay. no, no. Because we had Mike Butcher here in August, and he said uh, he's a founder of TechHub, yep. a co-working space. Yep. And uh, he said uh, TechHub.com was owned by some guy in Texas. And uh, Mike sent him an email that he's a uh, running a small computer repair shop in South London. Yeah. And he would like to buy the domain TechHub. Yeah, would you five hundred dollars be okay? And the guy said, okay. Yeah. When so I buy businesses it. today, I don't send it from the mattatfrance.com email address. I send it from my per like another personal email address because yeah. um, the, the zero gets added to the end. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, but yeah, no. Eventually, I just talked him on the phone, and I and I was just. Talking him up, talking him up, talking him up, uh, and eventually I got to a certain price, and he was like, um, "Okay, I accept." And I kept, like, I kept on like raising the price. He goes, "No, I've already accepted." 
Okay. And uh, so I bought it. And that, let me tell you, that was a pivotal moment in the business early on. Really was pivotal. Was it clear to you that this no. is the, the way to go? Uh, no, not clear at all. But I bought it. And uh -huh. let me tell you, it was very, very clear a few weeks later. So a few weeks later, we changed from... The funny thing was we were doing a logo comp a crowdsourced logo competition for yeah. the Get a Freelancer logo. Because the original Get a Freelancer logo was basically a man with two arms out. And someone wrote a cease and desist, desist letter. Um, uh, it looks like a man on a crucifix. And we got like a cease and desist, which is kind of funny. Uh -huh. So we thought, I wanted to change it anyway. Um, so we did this contest, and I, I put up $10,000 prize money on the platform to get a new logo. And I got, um, I think it was like 13,000 entries. Oh, wow. And I was looking through them all. And let me tell you, I had them all dumped in the directory. And I think, look, now we've got a platform so you can actually do it nicely on, on Freelancer. But at the, t at the time, I just dumped them all into the directory. And I was like hitting the space bar, one going through one. images. Okay. And so halfway through this, we changed the name. So I'm like, shit. So I had to, read, I had to jackpot the competition to $15,000 and start from scratch and look through another, I don't know, 20,000 logos or whatever it was. Uh -huh. And, um, did you see all of them? Yes, I did. And they became a blur very quickly. <laughs> like it was a blur. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but there's a nice story behind it. An Indonesian um, guy called Eduardo Sustrino um, won it. And he was, an, he was an architect who couldn't get a job in architecture. So he was doing online freelancing to pay for his wedding. And he was working as a cleaner during the day. And I gave him um, a lot of money, equivalent to, I think, 15 years wage or something for, for that logo. And yeah. it's a great logo. Because it's um, a hummingbird goes from flower to flower as freelancers go from job to job, and it's made of origami, which is you take something from with your hands that's very simple, and you make something beautiful out of it, yeah. and so forth. So it's, it, it fit in really nicely. Um, but then after that, about the name, so we changed the name, and then it just became immediately a clear, a, a clear that it was just brilliant. Oh. Well, because people would meet someone on the street and say, "Did you know you can get someone online to go build a website for you?" and and they'll go, uh, "Yeah, yeah, I've used this site called Olance." E-desk, whatever it was, they use freelancers. And they go back to home and they type into Google freelancer. And we were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10 on the front page of Google. All our links. There you go, yeah. Traffic exploded. Uh -huh. Memorability exploded. Um, you'd speak to a journalist. The journalist would forget the, the o, da o dance names. They remember freelancer every single time. So we yeah. got huge press. And you started seeing it because you know, one of the competitors had to start changing their ads. Well, but two, two of the major competitors stopped using the word freelancer. One started using the word contractor because every time they use the word freelancer, it just drives more traffic to us. I've heard but my mother thinks contractors build bridges, right? So <laughs> it's very confusing. And then, yeah. and then there's a tax classification for contractors, right? So that got them into trouble. So eventually I had to change back to freelancer. And then one of the, one, one of the companies had to say that their name equals freelance because their name was a riff on, 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 on my social ones. But so, oh. so they actually said, blah, blah, equals freelance. And so I knew at that point, I thought, this is genius because we've suddenly subordinated the brands of all the other guys. Mm -hmm. Plus, we've got the SEO boost, the PR boost, the memorability boost. And it just, that was one of the, the pivotal early points in the business. And so I hi highly recommend if you think about standard company, if you can find that premium domain name, get it. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it costs a fortune because you're about to resell it down the track if it doesn't work out. But the value of those of domain names, and, and I know now because we just bought a business called escrow.com, where pretty much all the world's domain names have transacted. Mm -hmm. $2.7 billion worth of domain names. And I looked through the, the database and they're all there. Well done. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So your, your smart moves were you bought a company which was already existing, half a million users. Uh, you then uh, started thinking smartly about uh, the name, mm. freelancer, SEO was great. Mm. Uh, now, uh, what are the, the hard parts of getting the first million of revenue? Well, we already had the first million. You so the had business that. had a million dollars of revenue, 1.1 million when I bought it. So that was the, me being impa partially being impatient and not wanting to do it from scratch. Yeah. So once I had that, it, was, it it's really became an optimization problem, right? And let, let me tell you, any, any business, once you're stuck in a million in revenue, you, and you have traffic, you can start doing these things like A-B tests. If you have no traffic, true, yeah. it's really hard to do an A-B test that's statistically significant because significant, you've got no traffic. True. Yeah. Right? So, so you can start pulling levers and knobs. You know, should I change, put a button here? Should I change the navigation menu item here? Whatever. You can start testing that stuff. And the more you do that, the more rapidly you do that, the more you get these you know, little upticks. And you know, right now today, if I checked in our online dashboard, you would have um, probably 30 or 40 a B tests running, yeah. 
a lot of them will fail, probably most of them will fail, mm -hmm. but you can maybe grind out 2% in the funnel here, you know, 3%, 1% in the funnel there. It adds up over time. It adds, and if you have a, it's just, you just have this process where you're just constantly just testing new things, grinding things out, mapping the, mapping the funnel. So you guys know what the funnel is? You know, the conversion funnel, um, you know, traffic goes to signups, goes to posted projects, goes to qualified projects, goes to, you know, first qualified good bid, awarded, accepted, completed, paid in full, repeat, right? They're, they're, all, your, all your businesses will have funnels and, and, and for different products will be different product funnels. And you just, just focus rigorously on just where is the fat in that funnel? How can you grind that out? Run tests constantly. Yeah, there's a great, there's a great new thing. Um, uh, um, concept that's, that's come out recently. We, we do this quite aggressively called growth sprints. And there's, what a, is that? And there's a tool, um, Sean Ellis, who's one of the okay. fantastic guys in growth, yeah. he's got a tool called Canvas, plug for Sean Ellis, um, which you should use. And it's for mapping out your growth sprints. And that you, you, what you do is you sit down and you, um, you run for, say, a week. Um, you sit down and you brainstorm in the morning of the first day a whole backlog of things you want to try. And, and these tests that you want to try, they have to be things you can complete that day, right? Not multi-day, but that day, yeah. little tests here or there. And you try and do a certain number per day, say three tests per day, and have them shipped, right? And you prioritize them by ICE, I-C-E. Um, what's the impact going to be, do you think, out of 10? What's the, um, uh, um, the confidence of your, of, the, of, your, of your judgment about things like impact? And what's the effort? So impact, confidence, and effort. Mm -hmm. You rank it, you prioritize it, you do these growth sprints, and and you, you push it out. And um, you know, just grinding away at it, you just see phenomenal, phenomenal results. Interesting. Uh, we have some questions on Slido, guys. If you want to uh, ask your questions on Slido, you just go to sli.do on your mobile. Uh, use the hashtag Startup Grind and just ask away. Uh, a question here is, what is the most unusual project that was completed on freelancer.com? Oh my god, every year, the crazy stuff that happens is just, stuff, is just yeah. out of control. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you see projects like this now, they're kind of almost, almost routine. It's like, we want to reverse engineer a boat in Norway, can we fly someone to Norway? So the team would fly someone from Spain to Norway to reverse engineer a boat. Uh -huh. There was, um, there's, a, there's a guy in... Um, in, in a swamp in Africa on a satellite phone researching the pygmy hippopotamus and wanted a poster done for that. And he literally said, I am in the swamp right now. I need the poster. <laughs> and got a, a poster for that. There was a kid, oh, I probably shouldn't mention this one. There's a kid that um, water ballooned his friend's house and wanted to get a team of people water ballooning it. So he was sitting at the window saying, I know, I know if you're doing it or not because I see water ballooning through the window. We don't, we don't encourage that. Okay. Um, there was a prisoner um, in, in, in jail uh, he wrote me a letter, and it was a um, typed letter, and he said, my name is so-and-so, I'm prisoner ID, whatever. He goes, I, um, I write books on prison education. Um, um, you know, I'm going to be, um, I would like to hire someone on Freelancer to help me um, get the book typeset and, 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 and read for publication. Um, and I, I'm going to be, um, you know, I, can, can I basically, basically post you letters and can you publish them for me? Uh, um, so I post you projects through mail physically and I can only pay by US check, uh, like a bank check of some sort. Uh, so we did that. And I, got a, I got a letter back um, yeah. a few months later saying, hi, this is prisoner so and so number, whatever. Um, I found this guy from Serbia. He was fantastic. He, he did all the stuff for me. Uh, I will have him on retainer for the next eight years until I get out of jail, at which point my PR team were like, you probably should have asked him what he's in jail for before you did that, <laughs> um, uh, and so on. But you know, yeah, people are getting, I've seen computational fluid dynamics over aerospace bodies. Um, you know, now we're public. I talk to a lot of um, finance people. They're all doing financial modeling of all their research. Yeah. Um, I mean, you name it, um, electric, electric um, uh, train for an uh, electric car um, company. I mean, you name it, it's there, I'm sure. Eva's got a bunch of, NASA. Oh, NASA. So NASA's using the site. They've, oh, um, they're, okay. they've done uh, 28 uh, contests this year where they're doing um, 3D modeling. And I mean, the results are phenomenal if you go to the NASA stuff oh. and I've got the pictures. But the, they're doing 3D modeling of, um, believe it or not, uh, there is a robotic astronaut which is currently on the International Space Station and has been there since 2011. It oh. looks like a human. It's called the, called the Robonaut R2. It is absolutely scary. But they've just upgraded the legs, and it's going to do EVA spacewalks out of the space station. And so they need to train the image recognition system on the um, on the Revenant 2 to be able to manipulate a lot of the objects, such as carry the flashlight, grappling hook, hold onto the handrail, etc. 
So on Freelancer, they built all the 3D models to train the image recognition system on the robotic astronaut. Right. So if NASA can use the site, anyone can use the site. That's very cool. uh, it's pretty phenomenal. Yes, and uh, you have some. You have a good vision. What I like about your way of looking at uh, your product is that uh, product. It's a service. So it's an eBay for not for for products, which is eBay. It's eBay for services. That's right. And uh, it, it's very smart. And I also heard you uh, speak to other people about looking at freelancer as a sovereign nation. Yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of um, it's very unusual. Yeah. The philosophy I have here is. Um, and it's, it comes in, it comes important with how we think about what we need to build on the site is, you know, Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world and every industry is waking up somewhat disruptively to discover it's now dominated by a software business, right? So, you know, the fastest growing telecoms company in the world is a software company. It's Skype, which is Microsoft. The biggest direct marketing company in the world is a software company. It's Google, dot, dot, dot. When I think through that narrative, I think about the freelancer and what, how we are, the, what we're doing. We are really in the very, very early stages of replicating the first country in software. Because we have an economy, we have employers, we have workers, we have a GDP. Our GDP is ranked 185, 187 globally in terms of countries. Yeah. Money goes through us. We have a rudimentary financial system. We have a rudimentary regulatory system. We have a rudimentary um, the police force being the support team, etc. So we think about what institutions you need to that that, that are needed in to, for countries to survive over time. Um, we think about that and how to empower. The, um, the 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 workforce to create rules and build communities and, and 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 so forth. So, you know, it's it probably sounds a little bit megalomaniac, but yeah, you know, he's a benevolent dictator. Um, uh, but yeah, it's kind system. of a bizarre you know, way, way in which I think about the site. Way. It's a very complex system. And uh, how would you decide if you want to change or increase the minimum wage, for example? Well, this is this is exactly it. We we make decisions on a daily basis. Do we want to raise the minimum wage in an area or lower it or do whatever? So it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of you know interesting from that perspective. I mean, the, ultimately, um, a lot of the stuff we do is really crowdsourced. So, yeah. a lot of the um, policing of the site, a lot of the rules and the regulations and the reporting comes from a very active community who will say we think this is right, this is this, this is wrong, and they'll tell us straight away. And every little bit of content on the site has a little button you can click and give us feedback or report something and so forth. So that, that's you know, the, a, lot, a lot of the secret sauce behind growing the business is actually to use the site to build the site yeah. in multiple different levels. When you're hiring a team, uh, how do you decide who stays uh, employed on a, on a full permanent basis uh, versus contractors or freelancers? Yeah, so um, the important, I, I always believe that the, the core competency you have, you should always own that 100% and keep that. So for us, that's our growth team, that's our engineering, um, the, the bulk of our engineering. But yeah. Everything else you can potentially be outsourced. So we use hundreds and hundreds of freelancers all the time. I, I use them. You know, I have a corporate development guy that I pay six dollars an hour in the Philippines that finds me acquisition opportunities, and I've given him, I give him a structure. I give really? Him, yeah, I give him an algorithm and a structure, uh -huh. and he goes out there and he he finds he, he fills in a spreadsheet, and I've I've filled it in with um, a, a big dump of candidates. I'm talking uh, close to. Um, well, it's in hundreds of thousands of candidates. I won't tell you how I've got that list. And he goes there and annotates it all. You know, is this publicly? Uh, is it a public company? Is it a private company? Is it venture backed? You know, how much money has been raised? Uh, how big is it? What, what revenue is it doing? And they sit, he sits, sits there and just fills it in. And then, you know, there's certain things I've told him I like and what I don't like, and he will annotate that. And and six bucks an hour. We have a PR person who is phenomenal. And yeah, there's a lot of jobs actually that can be ongoing for long periods of time on freelancer.com yeah. where if you can describe the job by an algorithm, it will get executed to perfection forever, like literally forever. There's a guy we hired in 2009 and his job was to wake up every morning, scan the news, look for any article written by any competitor or about the industry, uh, write it down in a spreadsheet, contact the journalist, say, hello, my name is so-and-so. Um, I saw your article, blah, blah, blah. Um, you should speak to Matt. He's an expert in the space. Mm. Uh, and email it. And he was sending about 40 emails a day originally. Um, we would get 10 replies, two or three interviews every single day. Um, and he would fill in a competitive spreadsheet um, with all the stuff. And we paid him $100 a month. Wow. He's an American. And I thought, this is amazing. Like, like how much do you want? $100. Okay, fine. And he's been doing that every single day for the last five or six years, although I pay him a lot more now. I've paid him substantially more. But, um, That's amazing. But um, 
you know, just it's phenomenal. That's been you know th using the freelancers on the site to do things for you. Um, it's just tremendous because you, yeah. you've got this elastic workforce. You can do whatever you want. That's quite amazing. Now the, the companies are getting bigger and bigger, and you decided to acquire uh, the, the smaller players, right? Yeah. And you just merged them with freelancer.com. That's what I did. Yeah. So you know, you go out there and you know, as soon as I had a bit of money, um, the cash flow coming in, I'll just find a small competitor I could buy, and bought it, and then yeah, made a bit more money and buy the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the, and 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 um, it's How been. How many companies did you merge this way? We bought about eighteen. 18? Yeah. Oh. Um, not all directly freelancer. We bought a conference, amongst other things. A um, conference? Bought, yeah, SIDSTART. We bought Australia's biggest technology conference, uh, which is which was fun, just just ran, and the people said it was phenomenal, the best, best Australian tech conference they've been to. Funny story. Well, I hired a guy uh, to do comms for me and uh, in Australia, and um, you, you, Adam hired him. <laughs> and um, he, he said, well, I run this conference as well. I said, you know, it's a great conference. I've been sponsoring it for many years. He goes, oh, do you want to buy the conference as well? I'm like, sure. <laughs> um, so we bought that. Well, and then he goes, you know, he goes, you know what? I actually don't want to run the conference anymore. And you know what? I actually don't want to, I want to go back and run an incubator. And it's like, okay, great. So we left this conference. So we thought, okay, what do we do with it? Okay, we guess we've got to make it bigger and better. So we, we, we ran it and it's really focused on, on growth. Uh, and startups, um, the videos will, sh will you, know, you can buy an online pass to watch the videos, but I'm sure at some point the content will come out for free. Oh. But it, it was phenomenal. But uh, you know, you just bought bought a bunch of the companies. And look, if you're a marketplace and you're in a marketplace business, you should buy all your competitors. You should buy all of them um, for the right price, because it's all about getting to getting big fast. Uh, typically, if you stack up the metrics of Greenfield's marketing versus acquisition for some of these marketplaces, if you're smart. And you're timely. You can typically buy them cheaper than what it cost you to market, mm -hmm. do the marketing. And these are experienced users who are, you know, as opposed to new users. So they're yeah. they're, they're power users. Uh, and you get rid of a competitor. The bigger scale, yeah. You get rid of the competitor. Mm -hmm. And when you think about marketplaces, you know, whatever it's car sales or whether it's real estate listings or whatever, they don't typically, if they don't work, go bust. They just get absorbed. They get consolidated, and ultimately, someone just buys them all. So you want to conquer the space. You have to. Yeah, and uh, the, the next big step, we have a couple of minutes left, uh, you decided to go IPO. Yeah. Why? So this is a really, this is an interesting story, and I, there's a good, good question up here I saw before about, about how to set the IPO price, which I'll talk about in a second. So what happened was we were running for, we'd been running for that five or six years. It's about a price, right? We, um, we oh. yeah, we'd, we'd been going, running along, we hadn't raised any money apart from the very beginning. And the great thing about bootstrapping is you retain control, you have complete ownership. Yeah. It's your master of your own domain. The bad thing is no one knows how big you are. And the typical US venture back business, they'll do a series A, series B, series C, D, and if you're unlucky, G. And at each point along the way, the money's been raised and there's a valuation in the ground. So everyone knows Twitter's this big because, well, Twitter's public now, but you know, everyone knows Pinterest is whatever big because they've done a round at this valuation, right? But when you're, when you're bootstrapped all the way, no one knows how big you are. Some people think you're big, some people think you're small, some people think you're a startup, whatever. So when we saw Instagram sell for, was it 1.13 billion, 551 days old, 15 staff, 13 staff, uh, no revenue, you're like, mm, maybe you should put a valuation stake in the ground somehow, just so people know we're actually real. Because we were, well, you know, we feed people, people's families in the developing world. We connect up, provide opportunity income in developing world nations. We power small businesses. We do all these great things. We literally change lives. Not many startups can say they change lives. We change lives. We literally, I've seen people, I've you know, gone to India, I've met some of our users that literally were destitute and poor, living on the street, and somehow they found the site in 2000 or whatever, and built themselves up, and they've got $20,000 in the bank, they've got a business now, whatever, and it's all through the site. Like, yeah. literally, it's phenomenal for so many people in the world. And it's just like, we just got frustrated that no one kind of knew a lot of the good, goodness we'd, we'd done. And so I thought, maybe we've got to take a bit of money and put a valuation stake in the ground. So we spoke to the... VCs and you know, the, the the US VCs today are they're very it's, they've got the system down. You know, once you get on, once you get to a certain size, they'll know that you're a certain size. They'll you know some junior uh, analyst will call you up every quarter. How's it going, Matt? Just checking in. How are you going on projects? How are you going on contests? You know, how's the revenue looking? Whatever. And you know, do you want to raise any money? You know, we're there for you if you want to you know, raise money. And you know, you'd get calls from all the guys. You know, Excel Insights, Sequoia. Kleiner Perkins. I mean, they, they, this is what they do, right? They've got big teams doing this now. Um, so we thought, okay, maybe we're at the point we should take a little bit of money in from someone 
small amount of money. We don't need it. We're, 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 um, we're profitable. Um, just to see, put a valuation stake in the ground. So we got a few term sheets. We talked a few of them up, got us to a certain price. We thought, okay, maybe we'll take something around this. And then someone came to me and said, Matt, I write a lot of stuff about technology policy in Australia. I get a lot of media just talking about how we should change the way we govern the country and whatever. I get a lot of, a lot of press. And they, they said to me, look, mate, you've always talked about the ASX being the future of financing technology businesses in Australia because the venture capital industry is still born and the ASX has done really, really well. It's the fourth biggest equity capital market in the world. It's as big as NASDAQ, right, for equity. But it's in resources, mining and oil and gas and so forth. And you've always said um, it's f phenomenal because if you're an early stage mining company with a few drill holes in the ground or maybe just a PowerPoint presentation, you get raise a few million dollars. It's easy. You write a business plan, it's a prospectus basically. You put it out there, you raise money. And the Australian public it will fund it. They fund, you know, they fund risky businesses all the time. Or if you're Rio Tinto or BHP, you can go raise a billion dollars. It's a deep equity market, That's right? True. I said, we should do it in tech. Why, why aren't you IPOing freelancer? And I, thought, I, look, I thought to myself, I thought, gee, yeah, I haven't really thought about it. And Zero had, Zero had listed, which is a New Zealand company. Yeah. And they at the time had a market cap of about $2 billion, And their revenue growth rate was identical to ours, but they were about one and a half years ahead of us. And I thought, gee, I would, I would actually have a fraction of that valuation. And just as we decided to go public, all this good stuff happened. We got a takeover offer for four hundred million dollars. Uh -huh. uh, came out of the woodwork. Um, got all this massive press. Um, did you think about it for a second, or hmm? uh, you wanted to just go IPO, or did you think about the offer? Well, I thought about the offer, and it was so, it's actually quite funny. I probably shouldn't tell the whole story about the offer, but because you're the sole founder, right? it went up by a hundred million dollars every two days, and okay. I never gave a price. I just said, "Oh no, not 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 the right number," and then it went up by a hundred million dollars, and I said, "Not the right number." It went up by a hundred million dollars, and not the right number. Uh -huh. At some point, it got to 400, and Simon was like, well, what do you want to do? You want to appoint a banker or what? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Um, and do a competitive process. And I thought to myself, what would I do myself? Um, and I had a friend who was um, wealthy and itinerant, and he'd call me up on Tuesdays and say, what are you doing? And I'd say, I'm working. It's 11 o'clock. It's tennis Tuesdays. And I'd be like, I'm working. And then Thursday, I get a phone call. Matt, what are you doing? It's tennis Thursdays. And I thought, gee, I don't want to be this guy. He's so annoying. Uh, <laughs> He's always out in the boat and, yeah. you know, playing tennis. I thought, gee, I wouldn't do that. I'd probably start another business like freelancer. Yeah. And I kind of like the one I have. So, yeah, so uh, I did think about it. I thought, gee, I'm too too young to sell it and become itinerant. Um, so I thought, gee, look, we're on a rocket ship. Why would you get off a rocket ship while it's still going up? So... Um, so anyway, I decided to list it, and all this good stuff happened. And, and then you wanted to list, uh, was Sydney just the, the first choice, or did you think about other, other exchanges? Oh, look, we've thought about the US. I mean, we're probably too small for the US. It's a lot more complicated, a lot more expensive. Yeah. Um, the ASX is actually phenomenal for listing um, uh, tech companies. Um, you can, the thing about listing is you write your own valuation to the perspective. So you say, this is the valuation. You don't, you don't have to go there and beg money from venture capitalists and argue about a valuation. You write it into the prospectus. Either it will get funded or it won't get funded. Uh -huh. There's a tech company at the moment in Australia with no revenue. It's got about $800 million market cap. Right? Free money. Pre, like, it's, it's $300,000 in revenue. Oh, wow. It's about $800 million market cap. Uh -huh. Right? Uh, I have a friend of mine, uh, Anthony, who is helping companies uh, going IPO. And he keeps telling me all these cases where uh, Silicon Valley-based companies are coming to Sydney. Uh, there's, to a, to there's a Silicon Valley company that's listed on the ASX recently, yeah. right? I mean, like, uh, I mean, this is actually even if in the UK, this is a serious financing option. You go and you write a prospectus, you list it on the ASX. You don't have to be down there physically, right? And the question and was, how did you decide your stock price? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a good. Price? So this is a good question. Yeah. So, so, so we thought, well, what price do you list it at? And you want to make sure that when you list a company, it goes up. Because that first day, it's kind of retarded. But if the stock goes down, people think it's a failed IPO, right? And so you need to go up. But the question is, how, how much up do you want it to go? And the rule of thumb is it has to go up by 15%. Yeah. If it's less than 15%, it's no good. If it's tough, but up at 15%, it's successful. This is really strange. So you're like, okay, how do I make sure it goes up? Okay, and I was a bit unsure. I had a takeover offer of 400. I thought, oh, well, I can't list it at 400 because takeover is at 400 and People think it's, that's a takeover offer, so that's at a premium, so it's going to be less than 400. Well, it's listed at half that, listed at 200, 
right? But we'll take the minimum amount we could possibly take, which is 7.5%. It's a um, tiny, tiny bit of stock. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll voluntarily escrow, so I won't sell any, none of us will sell any shares, it'll all be primary, that will maximize chance of success. We'll voluntarily escrow for 12 months, even though you don't need to, maximize the chance of success, keep it really tight, whatever. And um, so it's it. So we set the issue price at 50 cents, 200 million market cap. And then the day that it happens, the IPO happened, it's my little Justin Bieber moment because um, Twitter had IPO'd in the US and had the bird on exactly, the stock exchange. Yeah. We had our neon bird um, at the ASX. The media was all over it. This was just, there's like 50 media, at the thing, the cameras flashing everywhere. It was literally Justin Bieber moment. And I was on stage and they said, um, when you, I've, when you ring the bell, it's a physical bell, it says, make sure you ring it hard because the last person up there was a little Japanese guy and he couldn't really Literally hear the yeah. bell, so just ring it hard. So I'm there trying to figure out where the stock price is because it's 50 cents, right? And you're thinking 15% premium, like look for 60, 70 cents, 80 cents. And all I saw was this 2.50. I go, what's that? And they go, that's the stock price, ring the bell. So I rang the bell and I broke it. <laughs> I ripped the donger off the From bell exactly. and I held it up. Of course, the media went crazy. Yeah. It was the front page <laughs> of all the newspapers. It's a good PR you know, stunt. Elmer, Elmer from the Stock Exchange proclaimed, this is what new technology does to old technology. Yeah. Framed it. <laughs> We're hanging in the, in the office now. Everyone went absolutely batshit crazy. Yeah. Uh, market cap was over a billion dollars. Um, you know, it's just... It, it's, Crazy, crazy, yeah. crazy 24 yeah. hours. And today the, the price is quite volatile, isn't it? Yeah, so of course, when the stock goes up 520% in 10 minutes, um, you expect a bit of a roller coaster and people take profits. So it went, went uh, 50 cents, $2.60, um, down to a dollar, back to $1.65, and now it's about $1.80 uh -huh. or so, um, which is great. So now the valuation is roughly $600 million, $800 million? Uh, yeah, US dollars, Aussie dollars is about 800, yeah. 800 something, Aussie, uh -huh. yeah. So now you're IPO'd, uh, I, do you feel comfortable or do you still want to conquer the world? And phenomenal. Uh, it's we phenomenal. We're in a phenomenal position right now. We are, company is executing fantastically well. Revenue is accelerating. Um, we've basically bought all the competitors apart from one, a major one, yeah. uh, which merged in response to us going public. Um, we just bought a business called escrow.com. Hands up if any of you have used escrow.com before. A couple? Okay. This is the place where if you want to sell or buy anything of value on the internet, this is the place you go. You don't use, if you wanted to sell your car, you wouldn't sell your car using PayPal. There's chargebacks, there's reversals, there's buy protection, all sorts of stuff. You go to escrow.com, you sell your car, right? You sell paintings, jewelry, domain names, websites, whatever it may be. $2.7 billion in transaction volume through it to date. It was started by Fidelity nine, uh, 16 years ago, put 50 million bucks in it years ago. Last year did $320 million in transaction volume. Literally, if you buy and sell a, a website or domain, then this is the place to go. Okay. Right? And so uh, if freelance.com is like uh, Alibaba, is escrow like Alipay? Absolutely. So for a long time, I've been trying to figure out how to enter the payment space. There's a lot of reasons competitively why marketplaces need to own their payments businesses. I mean, eBay had PayPal. It's, it's going to be a complete disaster for eBay splitting it off. I think it'd be great for shareholders of uh, probably both of the companies, but ultimately PayPal. I'm pretty sure PayPal will sell to Apple pretty quickly. Um, I believe there's a tax thing in PayPal right now where okay. you, it's got to be 12 months on the market before it can be um, the tax benefit can be realised. Yeah. But the minute that goes off, if I am correct, I could be wrong. That would be snapped up in a nanosecond, and that would be a multi-way bid between Google, um, Facebook. Apple, but ultimately that's going to make Apple Pay work. So you, you bought your own PayPal, basically. For, for yeah, we bought our own PayPal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazon's got Amazon Payments. Mm -hmm. You know, Alibaba, Alipay. I mean, you, you name it. You, you have to, you have to own that. Otherwise, you can get. There's a whole bunch of value add. There's, you can also get screwed if you don't own it. Yeah. Uh, Shall we tell that story? About sure, that? quickly. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, when when Facebook went to enter Brazil, they had no penetration. It was Orkut. Orkut uh, was a Google product. It went sideways because um, a, a Brazilian engineer, I think, added some friends, and it just exploded in Portuguese content. And the Americans would go there, what is this? It's Portuguese. Go away. So they became huge in Brazil. And then, um, so when Facebook entered, um, they had no penetration, but inside Orchid, there was a company called Vostu. And Vostu was a gaming company. It was one-to-one -one with, with Zynga. Like, the games were identical. In fact, there's a lawsuit about how identical the games were. And... Um, 
which is ironic, <laughs> given Zynga's got the games from everywhere else. But um, when I went to enter, the payments processor for, for Voss2, um, I can't remember exactly what happened with the Facebook board or whatever, but something happened with the payments processor and they got all the payment information. And let me tell you, when you got the payments processor, you've got better information on the customer than potentially the, 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 the store does. Right, you go to Facebook, you type in Mickey Mouse as your name, but when you put your credit card in, it has your name, your billing address, your date of birth, it's got everything, right? So they had all this customer data, and then they took that and they just aggressively marketed, saying, hey, well, don't go to Vostu, go to Facebook, they'll give you free credit to play the same game you were playing yesterday. Right? Very and, smart uh, way of, of entering the market, yeah. Uh, Matt, I want to take some questions from the audience. Before we do that, uh, a few questions on you. Uh, I'm not sure if the audience knows that you have uh, 200,000 followers on LinkedIn. I didn't even know that until today. <laughs> and you are one of the you were one of the first very early influencers, right? Yeah. So when they started the, the LinkedIn started this influencer program, as they became more of a publishing platform, they wanted to get high quality content. So they reached out to 100 people, and I was quite honoured to be one of the first hundred. They had like Barack Obama, Deepak Chopra, David yeah. Cameron, Richard Branson, and, and me. And me um, the funny thing was at the beginning is that um, uh, when you go to view my profile, it was like. Uh, other profiles all viewed by the same people was you know, Richard Branson and Barack Obama, and you go to my page. So I was like, that was pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I use it for um, uh, running essays. I, have, I haven't written so many lately, but um, uh -huh. about technology and how to grow your business. There's a lot of problems that entrepreneurs have. There's, there's a lot of content out there, um, but a lot of the content out there is about either really early stage, yeah. how to grow a business, or really late stage, how to manage a multinational. There's not a lot of content about how do I manage a board yeah. how do i put together a board how do i remunerate a board member what should i pay a chairman right how do i you know how do i not screw up an employee stock plan how do i you know all that sort of stuff that i write about that i think people find quite yeah. valuable so, so you're in this country called freelancer uh and you also teach at the university of sydney i did for 15 years and then i resigned in in frustration uh last year you did um, why is that well the universities uh basically the model is deprecated right so you go to university and you you do this structured set of courses and you go through the structured program etc and you know it's being disintermediated now by online education so Udacity Coursera you, you guys probably all know the Sebastian I'd love story. to learn from you as an you know entrepreneur professor yeah well I'm gonna I, 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 when I get around to it I'll put my content online I so I, I copied that class that I told you about from from yeah. Stanford I copied that class I taught cryptography for 15 years but I also copied that class and so I put people through the whole um, yeah, how to how to build a startup and go through all the you know competitive strategy, okay. go to market strategy, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Do you mentor? Uh, not very many people. No. I don't have much spare time, but um, you know, it depends for the, for the right opportunity. Who is your mentor, or who are your mentors? I had some great guys early on that were, that were phenomenal in my career. Um, Alan Little, uh, Bill Barty, George Foster. Uh, these were my independent directors in my last company, mm -hmm. and they taught me so much about how to run a business and how to you know, how to get things done. So I owe them a lot. Okay. Now let's go to the audience for some questions. Uh, let's take uh, several ones because we're running over time, but uh, this is important. So please stand up and uh, tell us which uh, you want to ask. My question is about the government space. My background's in politics and government, and I've seen a lot of waste and inefficiencies in bureaucracies. And as governments look now with, with a smaller tax base, lower demographics in Western countries. How much work are you doing or targeting governments to do governing and say legislating and lawmaking through a freelance model? Uh, we do very little. Um, I do get invited to speak on policy a lot of the, you know, this, that, the this, that, the other, but we, we do very little in government and we do very little in enterprise. And um, we deliberately do not do enterprise. Um, but you know, government is starting to adopt us and use us and, and, and think about using, I mean, obviously NASA, which is government body, um, they were blown away when they when they did the first contest. Um, the guy who runs the program came back to me and said, "This is the crack that will feed my crack addiction." You know, uh, and the reason why is you know the way they you, and I get, I get I get government people all the time emailing me saying, "I just use your platform and let me tell you how blown away I am." Yeah, you know, I'm from the government of Victoria or whatever, and you know the way I had to use to get things done, like I want a website to be built just for some simple program we're, we're doing. I'd have to write the job specification, I'd have to advertise internally first, then put it out uh, externally, get a room, get a key card, get a computer set up for them, etc. have a full-time role under a contract maybe for three months, six months, nine months, whatever it is, 
and um, it would take me you know, a year to get this something done and it would cost me this much money. He goes, I used your website for the first time last week. I, uh, it cost me $50 and it was done in three days. And he is like, oh, Jesus Christ, if I could just tell the government, you need to be using this site. It, but it, it, it's the same reason why we don't pitch to enterprise. We don't go to um, enterprise and say, use freelancer. And the reason why is we had these conversations years ago. You go meet Deutsche Bank or whoever it may be and you say, you know, have you heard about France? And they go, this is amazing. You know, it's a collaborative economy. It's crowdsourcing. It's, on, it's, it's, it's the future. It's clearly the future. You know, Deutsche Bank, whoever, should be all over this. Let's go have a meeting. So you have a meeting. And the stakeholders come in. It's the VP of HR, VP of legal, VP of compliance. Where's this job going? Pakistan. Have you done drug testing? No. Have you done background testing? No. Well, they go and think about it. And they go, well, look, we love the concept. Um, is there some way that we can just get a white label version of your platform and using our existing network of suppliers and just put them on your platform? And the answer is no, because that's just event that you're, you're enterprise offering at that point. And I'm still scared of running a sales team, so I don't want to do that. So. Hi, uh, my name is Rutger. Um, I wanted to ask you, you see a lot of um, sort of freelancer platforms come up and they're much more vertically integrated uh, or they're much more focused on a specific niche. Um, how does it impact your business? W what do you think of, of their business models? Yeah, I mean, the, the, they come and go all the time every every week, particularly in graphic, graphic design. Every week another graphic designer comes with a new graphic design marketplace. The problem is it's um, in our space, which is the consumer marketplace space, it's when it takes all. So the buyer's going to go where the sellers are, the sellers want to go where the buyers are. I mean, eBay's number one in products. Who's number two? It's a long way down, right? Um, the problem is that you don't get volume. In the, in the, so at the moment, the sites that are out there that um, compete against us that we haven't bought are mainly geographically focused or they're vertically focused in industry. So you know, three German marketplaces, two Japanese marketplaces, four Russian marketplaces, there's graphic design marketplaces, there's legal services marketplaces and so forth. Um, the problem is the volume in these marketplaces is tiny compared to the real opportunity. Maybe in a few years, maybe if we become a multi-billion dollar business, the verticals will be big enough to actually su support a billion dollar business, but right now they only support very, very small businesses. And so all these marketplaces for the most part monetize through methods which I, I think are frankly over monetized. They rely heavily on memberships, so you can't bid on a job unless you own a membership, or they charge a commission of say uh, 50%, 40%. So um, they don't grow very fast because it's, it's, it's too tough. But they're out there. I think the main thing is that we have to be very cognizant of what the new business models are and how, how the customized experience actually, um, if there is a model that, that is showing traction, we will implement it in a feature upgrade and we'll eat the whole business model. So for example, crowdsource contests, that started seeing, seeing some traction. We ate the whole business model in six weeks with a feature upgrade. Um, you don't want to be eBay or, or Craigslist and because e eBay and Craigslist have not innovated over the last decade. Craig thinks it was funny to kind of run the business, I think, is a, is a, is a commune or what have you. But, you know, um, that's why OkCupid has taken dating and Airbnb has taken vacation rentals and we took freelance work and, you know, Seek has taken you know, full-time jobs, et cetera, and you get the eyes picked out of you, right, of all the verticals, right? It's a funny exercise. You can go Craigslist, you can get every single vertical, you can see someone's picked out the eyes of that. So we have to be cognizant of that to make sure that if there is a better experience, we should be catering for that. Um, but right now, the, the verticals are too, too small. I think to build big businesses. How did you build your supply database? Sorry, how did you build your in developing countries, for instance? How did you go out there where you didn't even know if they had internet access, and yeah, suddenly just grab them? We have done pretty much zero marketing in the developing world, yet we're like number twenty in Bangladesh, number fifty in Pakistan, number one hundred, nothing in India. Um, a lot of that happens. I know people say word of mouth, and a lot of time they say word of mouth is it's 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 a euphemism for I don't know, uh, or I don't, or I don't want to tell you. Um, when someone makes their month salary in three hours, they go and tell all their friends, and they hire them as fast as they can, right? And that's pretty much in the developing world. We spend um, in the emerging markets, we spend very little in terms of marketing. We do some, maybe some PR here or there, um, but we don't pay for ads or anything like that because literally, it is such a life changing product for people in places like Bangladesh, that it just grows like wildfire. Like, and just every, everyone knows it. And a funny little anecdote, I did a, I did a thing like this on uh, ANC Shop Talk in the Philippines. So this is like a CNN sort of thing, and it was a little chat like this. And I had um, a web developer, um, uh, Junillo, and I had a, um, a lady who was a freelance um, copywriter. 
and that went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and then the, the, the host said, and so you're just, uh, Junilla, you're a, you're, a, you're a full time, you have a full time job doing web development, but in, in the evenings and on the weekends, you do some freelance work just uh, on the side, and, and uh, I can't remember the lady's name, come to me in a second, and, and you were a stout home mum of two who used to um, work, uh, she's actually trained in genetic engineering, which blew me away, who writes articles as a copywriter online, and you're just supplementing your income on the side with a little bit of spare money. And they said, oh no. Everybody in the Philippines knows you make more money being a freelancer than you do in your full-time job, right? And the, the presenter is like, what? Yeah, we make like you know, five times the income from the part-time job than we make from the full-time job, or 10 times, right? And we just, well, do you know, why do you go to work? He goes, because I get lonely at home, you know? And, and then at the end, she's like, oh, do you think it's got any work for voiceover talent? I'm going to give you a business card, uh, the, the, the host. So, um, you know, so it's just growing. Uh, PR we do because it's cheap, um, but very little in terms of active marketing there. And we have a lot of ambassadors. A lot of people will go out there and just talk about freelance because they love it. And the gov governments will do that as well. I mean, the Malaysian government just recently, under a program by e, um, called Irizeki by MDEC, they believe the bottom 20% of the population socioeconomically, the only solution to get them employed, and not fully employed, but as employed as much as possible, is through crowd work online. And that's because the bottom 20% there, the elderly, they're in firms, they're young, they're remote rural areas, they're disadvantaged in some way, but they do have some percentage of time they could go online and do a bit of micro work or whatever it may be. And so we just, for example, they came to us, we didn't go to them, and we just completed training 60 trainers. We did train the trainers, and the Malaysian government is paying for 60 people to go out to remote communities and tell them how to use our website. So it's some pretty phenomenal stuff there in terms of the impact. Yeah, hi Matt, great talk so far, thanks. Um, my question is, um, if you had your time again, um, what would you do to move faster? I thought you were going to say, um, what would you do cool differently? Question. And I, I was like going to say to you, I wouldn't change a thing other than I wish I could do it faster. <laughs> so it's a great question. Um, look, every day I think to myself, I wake up and gee, all these ideas I, I want to implement. Yeah, I have ideas from 2009 that we're only just shipping now on the product. It's, you know, I think I would probably have formula, I think realistically, um, the, the way in which we kind of grow the business now, which is the whole thing around growth and data science, if I had structured that earlier on and more aggressively and got, you know, rolled out sort of agile processes more early on and structured the teams differently more early on, we'll be a lot quicker. So what happens is, you start a company, you've got five people, you'll sit together, you're quite agile, right? You're just in a room, five people. And you might not have a formal, you're not, not doing any you know, scrums or anything like that, any, any of the agile methodologies, but you're just five people and you're quick because you're just there. You talk to someone, hey, can you do this meeting? Yeah, done. Then you get to 10, 20 people, still reasonably fast, but because you can see everyone, you're just in a room, let's do this, let's do that, okay, let's do that, can move quickly. Then you get to a certain point and the designers sit together because they're doing design. The engineers sit together because they're doing engineering. The de DevOps guys want to sit together because they do DevOps and they chat and they've got similar, they like talking to each other because you know, this is what they do, right? And then what happens is you just, the productivity of the company just goes like this because you're trying to do something and the engineers are waiting for the designers, the designers are waiting for the DevOps guy, the DevOps guy waiting for the product manager, the product manager waiting for the engineer. And they're not sitting next to each other anymore. So they're like, okay, well, hasn't, I haven't done it yet because the guy hasn't sent me the file, so I'll go and do something else now. And just the productivity just goes like this, right? And you need to break all of that up. And so it, I probably did that too, a lot, lot later than I should have done it. I did it, we got to about, um, well, we're probably about 200, 200 people before I did that, before I restructured it. And so I made it product groups. So I said, listen, um, I want... In a team, I want them to, you to be independent. I, want, I don't want you waiting like for anyone else. Like mini startups in the company. So, huh? Like mini startups in the yeah, company. Yeah, you break, you break it up. So you have the engineer sitting next to the computer, next to the data scientist, sitting next to the, the designer, next to the DevOps guy, and they're in one team, and they don't have to rely on anyone else, and they just get things done. Yeah, and, it's the, and, 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 and this became really evident because we do these things called hackathons every quarter. So every quarter, just go and form a team, go do whatever you want. We do it for 24 hours, a lot of alcohol involved, music, whatever, entertainment. And the productivity in those hackathons was like six months of productivity in one day. And we're like, fundamentally, what is happening here? Why are people so much more productive in these hackathons than they are in their day job? And we figured out it's because they, A, they're passionate about what they're doing. 
So you've got to let people move around the teams a lot more. And they fundamentally, you form a team and you're, you're just the team. You have to rely on anyone else, so you just go and do it, right? And they're passionate and, they, and, the, and the productivity gains were, were huge. And then and the, this is the whole thing about data science as well, just that structured process of, you know, the worst thing you can do is just launch a whole new website. Some things will be good, some things will be bad. Yeah. You get cancellation out and, and, and so forth. But just, you know, this whole growth sprint, for, you know, philosophy. The hackathons are great insights because uh, you're one of the few companies I've heard of uh, who are doing that. Uh, the only other one, which is quite, quite a big one, is uh, a company we had here on stage uh, last January. Back then, they had 35 million customers. Mm -hmm. Today, they have 110 million customers. Uh, this is the only other company I know of who does hackathons internally, big competitions, and they are so productive in that. Uh, they're massively productive. Great insight. They're, they're, and it's a lot of fun, and it breaks up the monotony, but some of the biggest innovations we have have come in 24 hours. Yeah. It's That's phenomenal. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest next step for you? What is the milestone you want to achieve? Well, I mean, the, the, the really big thing happening right now is we've bought this escrow.com business, which is going to be our payments business. So we're going to grow that massively. Yeah. Um, this is a business that, you know, it started by Fidelity 16 years ago, 50 million in financing from SoftBank uh, and so forth early on. Um, dot com crash happened. And I didn't talk about this whole um, uh, uh, bubble thing. I should probably yeah. talk about it for one minute. Uh, technology doesn't get into a bubble. Every year, technology gets better and better and better and better and better. It's the nature of technology. It doesn't get into a bubble. The bubble was a public markets phenomenon where the, where the, where the, the financing of these businesses in the public markets context got ahead of itself, right? And what happens when the public market said, whoa, in 2001, yeah, I think we should you know, pull back a little bit because the business models here are not, not really gelling with the technology. The funding drew up, uh, dried up. When the funding dried up, what happened? Where was that money going? That money was being spent by, it was raised by technology companies, but it was being spent with other technology companies on advertising, right? So as soon as the, the funding dried up, the advertising dried up, and, and then all the companies that relied on advertising the business model collapsed, right? You had this domino effect, right? But Cisco got better year on year, Google got better year on year, Apple got better year on year. The technology got better and better and better and better and better, right? And now what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a bit of a bubble in the private valuation stage because the whole concept of unicorn came out. I don't know why people thought it was a good idea to have a billion dollar valuation in the private context, whether it was vanity or whether it was for hiring or, or whatever. But these things are fine, I'll give you a billion dollar valuation. Just give me a two times liquidation preference and a ratchet on, the, on, on, yeah. on my financing. And you, know, you can have whatever number you want. You can write it into the term sheet with a crayon if you want. And because you know, the payoff matrix in, a, in, a, in either an IPO or a, or a trade sale I get whatever I want anyway, right? So it doesn't matter what number that, that, that says. So you think and it's a bubble now and uh, how well, bad is it going to be? Well, what, what's happened is the problem is that it, 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 some companies, there's this big philosophy in, 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 in the Silicon Valley, which is grow and hyper growth and grow, 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 grow. But to yeah. do that, you have to raise a lot of money and finance your growth. And some companies are growing really, really rapidly and becoming dominant and getting, you know, you know, building such a moat around them that you know, out the other side of that, no one can touch you. There's a lot of companies going through hyper growth that actually don't have a competitive moat around them. And I won't mention names specifically, but there's you know, one very, very, very large company that literally has no lock-in. That's a multi-billion dollar company, has no lock-in to the business model whatsoever, right? Think they have network effects, they don't in my opinion. But um, what these companies are doing is they're raising money, they raise $50 million, spend it on marketing, dump it into a channel. Now these channels, you can't just dump $50 million on marketing and get $50 million in return, right? These, these channels distort. Um, the, the most crucial line of the code in your business is the CPA has to be less than the LTV. The cost to acquire a customer yes, has sure. to be less, less than the long term mm -hmm. long term value of the customer. In fact, it's more nuanced than that. It's got to be less than the short term value of the customer, which is it's a cash flow financing issue. I spend a dollar, how fast do I make that dollar back? And then it's a cash flow situation of how aggressively you want to set the CPAs on, on, on various channels. So when you dump 50 million bucks into a channel, you fucking distort the shit out of it, right? And that the channel that was giving you a dollar ten back for the dollar now gets you costs you three dollars and you get back fifty cents, right? It doesn't make sense. And as these well. financing documents are being leaked over time, you're seeing these companies. And the way they're growing these hyper growth is they raise fifty million, dump into a channel, make make forty five million back. Yeah. Then they go raise a hundred million on this hyper growth, uh, make eighty five million dollars back after dumping into a channel. Then they go raise two hundred million dollars, dump it in, make one hundred fifty million dollars back. Then they go raise a billion dollars, dump into a channel, make five hundred million dollars back, and they show this ridiculous hyper growth in revenue. But the marketing is unprofitable. And the only thing that's happening is you're doing value transfer to the venture capitalists of here, take my business for these payments. And at the end of the day, what ends up, ends up happening is you run out of investors, right? So it's like past the parcel, finding the greater fool. When it gets up to the top and you start going to the public markets, guys, so you go to Fidelity, you go to 
you know, Vanguard, whoever, uh, and you get them to, you know, T. Rowe, um, Price, and so forth, and they start investing. And then you run out of those guys, so you've got the debt markets each year. But, but effectively, those late-stage uh, investments were already debt because they were synthesized. Uh, it's, it's, it's equity, but it's, it's synthesized debt because you've got um, ratchets, you've got um, liquidation preference. Oh, it's all structured. It's, it's kind of like a pseudo-debt product to a certain extent. But what's happened now is you've got all these unicorns that were raised these big, big, big valuations, and those valuations are not transferring uh, in into the public market context. And, and, and so you had a few companies come out, like Box, et cetera, um, um, a great company. You know, unfortunately for Aaron, he raised his Series G. The $150 million in the Series G had a ratchet on it. So when it went That's public, crazy. it had a minimum guaranteed return. And when that minimum guaranteed return was not hit, the shares ratcheted up. Uh, and so what happens is everyone, all the, all the common gets squeezed, mm -hmm. basically. And so these translations are not happening. So Box goes out, Box halves. Dropbox then goes to try public, goes, tries to go public. Box is just half. Who's going to invest in Dropbox and an IPO of Box just half because they're the same sort of product? Geez. Yeah. You know, Square, same problem, et cetera. So, and, 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 and it's now happening. The crunch is now happening because companies like Fidelity, they have to mark to market. So they come like a public investor, not a private investor, but they're dabbling in the private world, trying to juice up a bit of funds. And for them, it's just a small, a small change. Right? They've got billions of dollars in the public market context. So sticking a few hundred million dollars into the private context, well, it's just, it could gear their funds up, a bit of chump change, whatever. But because they mark to market, what you're seeing now, and it's done by an independent valuation team, is you're seeing these companies that, you're hearing about these valuations on, on TechCrunch, and then you're seeing the Fidelity report saying, no, no, the valuation we've marked to market is 25% below that, or 50% below that. The people are going, hang on, what's going on there? So people are going, well, gee, are these unicorns really That's unicorns not right. or not? Right? And there's a stumbling exiting those businesses into, into the public markets world because the public market world is now a bit skeptical. And that's why you see Square came out, it was going to be priced between 11 and $13, got priced. <laughs> that was Square interrupting. <laughs> that was quite vicious. You're seeing, uh, so it's priced between $11 and $13, comes out at $9, but the, but the last investors in got a ratchet up to $18. So when the company went public, even though it was a lower end of the valuation, the last guys got ratcheted to $18, which got double the number of shares. And then the really unfortunate thing is the IPO popped 60%. So even though they doubled the shares and it was below the valuation, the share price popped back into the valuation range. On the, so, so the guys who are making it like bandits are the late stage guys and the guys are getting screwed at all the staff and all the common. Uh, please uh, give a big round of applause to Madbury.